Uh, welcome to this CNCF webinar and um, my name is Baruch. Um, I am the, um, uh, the host of today's webinar and, and before we start, just a um, couple of uh, uh, housekeeping items. First of all, as this is a webinar, you're all on mute, which does not mean that we don't want to hear from you. We definitely do want to hear from you. Uh, there is a Q&A panel that uh, at the bottom of your screen, and uh, please go ahead and uh, put there any questions that um, that you might have. Um, also, this webinar is recorded, um, and you'll be able to get the recording after um, after it is done. Uh, also. Uh, uh, a reminder, this is official webinar of the um, CNCF and is such a subject to the CNCF code of conduct. So please do not uh, add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of the code of conduct. Basically, please be respectful to all the fellow participants and presenters. With that, let's get to business. So, uh, uh, I have a co-host here with me, um, Leonid Golnik. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. And with Leonid, we're going to uh, discuss today how to influence DevOps without authority, hopefully in ways more successful than yelling at DevOps. Well, and we're gonna take you on this mythical journey together with uh, our friend, Alex. Uh, they are a system administrator, old school system administrator in, in a company that is not exactly a software company, Western Textile. And uh, like uh, a typical old school company, they're facing some of the typical problems a system administrator would uh, face. You know, the software gets tossed over the wall and the development team uh, leaves them to fend for themselves, hoping for the best. Well... Alex is obviously upset with this state of things and embarks on a journey to find a solution. One of the potential solutions to this problem looks like DevOps. A lot of people write about it and they mention literally DevOps as the solution for the problem of silos. Another very nice side benefit of doing DevOps is uh, apparently money. If you look at the salaries of system administrators comparing to DevOps engineers, you can see, and Alex so that being a DevOps engineer actually is much more attractive. So uh, Alex uh, does what a rational person would do, uh, applies for one of those jobs and finds a new one as a DevOps uh, engineer at a fabric company this time. And as you can imagine, to Alex's dismay, the situation is not much different. Well, Alex does what DevOps engineers are supposed to do, DevOps engineering, um, installing Jenkins on a desktop computer under their desk, or implementing DevOps in their own DevOps engineers department, and basically DevOps engineering all the way. So For basically, some strange reason, it doesn't really help. Yeah, basically we're back to that vicious circle of... Uh, Get software getting tossed over the wall. So Alex is starting to realize that DevOps is not really a job title or a position. Uh, DevOps is a set of practices and uh, goes ahead and learns more about them. And of course, where you learn about DevOps, if not the source of all truths in the world, uh, the Wikipedia. But Alex goes even further and uh, realizes there are some really good uh, books on the subject. Uh, Baruch and I like to talk about the three of them to start, right? The Phoenix Project, the fundamental kind of the seminal book about the DevOps practices. Uh, the follow on to that, which is the DevOps handbook that talks about the mechanics and implementing uh, the DevOps. And of course, the Accelerate book. Uh, and that, that gives Alex a good set of practices that equipment with the theoretical foundations. Uh, Alex starts to realize that it's not about the DevOps department or DevOps job title. It's about a set of practices and deep specializations that bring and set of practices that bring those practices together, right, with common goals and common culture. On this journey of discovering what DevOps is and learning about DevOps, Alex also discovers the State of DevOps report. And this, um, as the participants of CNC webinar, you probably know one of the most important researches in our space. Um, and uh, it analyzes uh, more than 30,000 organizations in terms of where they stand in their DevOps journey. 
and Alex sees the metrics and compares their organization to others and discover that their organization is a pretty much in a low, uh, low perform performance when it comes to uh, implementing DevOps. They uh, release uh, very rarely, um, their lead time for changes is, is, is pretty long, um, it takes ages to restore service, and uh, but a lot of their deployments actually go bad. Um, they also discover that the majority of the industry uh, are leaps and bounds ahead, and uh, there is this group of elite perform uh, performers, and those elite performers actually grew three times just in one year. Uh, since 2018 to 2019, um, from 7% to 20% of the organizations are now elite performers. And Alex starts to wonder why. It is interesting to, to wonder about that in the age of every company being a software company. And obviously, every company cares about who? They care about their customers or about the users, right? And what do those users or those customers want? Well, naturally, they want new features, right? It's the competition for survival and delivering the right capability at the right time. Uh, and ideally faster than your competitor, so you can keep your users that you've already acquired and perhaps acquiring the new one. So the next natural question is, when do they want those features? And of course, as a user myself, I want those features now. Speed kills. Somebody who can deliver a capability I'm looking for when I want it will probably win over somebody who cannot. On top of that, uh, and you see that evolutionary pressure in the DevOps report as well. You start seeing the strong getting stronger and starting to separate themselves from the medium performance, right? The medium performance category has grown and the elite uh, category has grown and the, the, the part in the middle is continuing to shrink. And that's for me a perfect example of an evolutionary pressure of companies that will figure it out and will survive and adopt new practices and continue to please and delight uh, their customers and their users. And those that will going to be falling by the way of a fall, by the way of a progress. And I think in the current economic environment, that evolutionary pressure will only increase. The competition for the user and for the dollar will only be that much harder. So not only Alex understand that in their organization, obviously, and when Alex get themselves into some very important meetings with some very important people in their organization, they hear the same thing. We need to release faster. But they also th hear some very uh, strange and bizarre ideas of how to do that. Some people will say, well, DevOps helps, so let's just hire more DevOps engineers. Other people say, let's remove bottlenecks. QA is a bottleneck. Let's just fire out the testers and we will release faster. And more often than not, when Alex actually suggests implementing DevOps the right way, the culture, the methodology, well, you know how this meme ends. And uh, it's... There lies the rub. Unfortunately, that's how the bottoms up transformations at a lot of companies uh, end up. And the reason for that is pretty simple. The folks that are pushing for those uh, uh, bottoms up transformations tend to find themselves uh, talking to uh, stakeholders at the very top of the organizational chart. Uh, those are the folks that can make the decisions and move the organization forward. And very often they end up finding themselves as far down the organizational chart as you can imagine and not being equipped with the right tools and techniques uh, is not helpful. So this is all very grim, but um, our hero Alex finds the way and uh, we want to present you with this way. Hopefully it will help you um, in, the, in the same situation. And by we, I mean, my name is Baruch Sadogurski. I'm the chief sticker officer at JFrog. No stickers now, so uh, only head of DevOps advocacy. I'm uh, also a proud CNCF ambassador. Um, and the most important piece of information on this slide is my Twitter handle at uh, jbaruch. And my name is Leonid Igolnik. I'm a software engineer and an engineering leader who was lucky enough to find himself uh, at the right place at the right time 23 years ago. Uh, and uh, for the last 23 years, I've been building SaaS products, uh, most recently heading engineering at one of the CNCF uh, sponsors, a company called SignalFX, where we were helping our customers monitor some of those modern high-velocity environments. 
And now to the most important slide of today's webinar, uh, jeffrey.com show notes. Uh, you go there and uh, you will find a special page dedicated to this webinar on which you will find those slides, the video once it's published. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, all the links, everything that we already mentioned, like the books and the uh, State of DevOps report, and everything that we will mention down the road, um, a place to comment, to rate, and a very, very nice raffle for thanking you for being here that you definitely shouldn't miss. Uh, to make it easier for you to always go to this page and also to follow us on Twitter, our Twitter handles, the official CNCF Twitter, uh, Twitter hashtag, and the link to show notes will be visible on each and every slide. So it will be more convenient to you to actually uh, go there. Now, as you may judge by slight accents Baruch and I have, we grew up in the former USSR, a country that was founded on one of the principles of always learning. And in order for you to be equipped for any kind of DevOps transformations, you will have to also learn. And we have a set, good set of books to recommend for you to start uh, that will give you that theoretical foundation. Yeah, so uh, Leonid already mentioned a couple of them, like the Phoenix Project um, and uh, DevOps Handbook. Uh, just to add to those, the Unicorn Project, which is kind of an alternative reality novel for the Phoenix Project. Um, and uh, Accelerate is actually the, the, the theoretical foundation behind the State of DevOps report, also very important. War and Peace and IT, very important book that actually tells the story of DevOps in the lingo of the managers that we are trying to influence. So that's a very important weapon in our uh, inventory. Um, Liquid Software, the book that I have uh, honor to co-authoring co with two um, co-founders of JFrog um, and uh, stuff like Site Reliability Engineering. And that's about who the real DevOps engineers are the people who are in charge of the DevOps infrastructure in your organization. And there's a ton of other content out there, including uh, several great podcasts. One of them is hosted by Barak called DevOps Speak Easy, uh, DevOps -ish and uh, tons of others. There are a lot of, uh, of the DevOps days uh, presentations and uh, talks that are available on YouTube that you can just find them. Most of them are recorded. And lastly, we also wanted to mention a tool that we like to go to uh, to see the state of technology practices, tools, uh, and techniques from a company called ThoughtWorks that publishes the technology radar. They just unveiled uh, the new version uh, preview uh, this week. Uh, and that's a great tool to see what, uh, what techniques ThoughtWorks believes you should be adopting or maybe considering to adopt. Uh, and they do pretty good and deep research on those. So we always like that as a source of up-to-date information. So you read everything, you know everything, you harvested tons of information, and now you feel pretty confident to go to your boss and dump all this information on them to make sure they understand that they need to implement DevOps properly. And yet, in spite of that readiness, you tend to find yourself in the situation like that. Let's dig into some of the reasons as to why that is the case. Well, it's kind of, you need to be prepared to take a lot of no's. Some of them might come in plain rejection. No, we have other stuff to do, not our priorities. We're not gonna do it. Others can, for, can come in the form of, yeah, sure, it's a great idea. Maybe we'll get to that later, and then people get distracted. You will also encounter yourself uh, talking to people that will be all the talk and getting all excited, uh, uh, but never engaging or never helping you with any of your goals. So we'll, we'll talk about how to diagnose that situation. And then in general, like any change, and, and if you remember studying chemistry, there's this concept in chemistry called the activation energy, right? The, ener the energy you have to put into the system to get the reaction going. You, you have to put a, a certain amount of energy into your system that you're trying to transform to get the transformation rolling. And that activation energy is, is hard to, to get into the system sometimes. So in general, you will have a lot of very good compelling reasons to give up and you will be very, very tempted just to throw the towel and say, you know what, I don't wanna do it anymore. But as Winston Churchill teaches us, Never give in, never, never, never. 
And as much as it is important not to give in or give up, it's also important to remember not to try to boil the ocean <clears throat> because that also is a lose-lose proposition. And that brings us to the book that we wanted to highlight today that will guide uh, the rest of our discussion. Uh, one of our favorite uh, models for that type of influence that uh, you need or Alex needs as well uh, to get the transformation going from not a position of authority, but from a position of being a member of the organization is uh, a book that teaches you about that types of influence and how to influence uh, people without authority, unclean named influence without authority. And the book walks you through a six step model that we will decompose uh, together uh, in the talk step by step. So why don't we begin with step one, the most important step and typically not a very intuitive step. The book encourages you to assume that everybody in the organization, whether you know that or not, can be your potential ally. Well, that's a great idea to assume that everybody are friends, but obviously there are a lot of stakeholders in the organization. If everybody are allies, who do I actually speak to? So we'll, we'll give you some concrete examples as to where to find some of the better allies that you can uh, partner up with for your uh, journey. So uh, in any organization, sometimes you can find a forward-looking team. They may have come from outside of an organization. They may uh, just want to embrace some of the new techniques before the rest of the organization is. And learning about the organization and understanding your organizational landscape so you can find that forward-looking team is a very important technique to finding your partners in crime. Furthermore, sometimes uh, in an organization, you may have a highly visible project. That project, uh, especially if it's done by a forward-looking team, is also a, a ripe opportunity for partnership on a transformation because if you are successful, and we all hope that you are, uh, that visibility will help you with the activation energy we talked about earlier. It is important to remember that not every visible team uh, is a team that wants to do the right thing. So you have to learn how to diagnose those situations as well. And in order to do all of that, uh, there is no better tool than a water cooler talk. Talking to people, understanding what's happening in their professional lives is an important tool and technique for discovering the forward-looking teams, the visible teams, and the teams that may be a good opportunity to partner up with. What you need to remember when you approach all those people, stakeholders, teams, is why would they want to help you? Why would they want to advance your cause? Why would, you, why would they do anything for you? And there are a lot of reasons, and here are some less intuitive examples. So first of all, it might advance their career. And nothing wrong with that. It's a great motivator. In the end of the day, it's a group effort. And if you manage to transform your organization with the help of all those people, the, this achievement, this transformation will go directly to their resume on each and every one of you. And that's a great driver. Generally, when it comes to people motivation, it might be not as intuitive as you assume. Um, in a great book, Drive by Daniel Pink, Daniel actually explains that not everything is stick and carrot. More so, once we go past through a simple uh, mechanical work, stick and carrot doesn't work. What does work? Stuff like giving people autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Down the road today, we will show you how different uh, organiza people in different organizations within your company can fulfill autonomy, mastery, and purpose by implementing DevOps correctly. Another thing that you need to remember is that people are irrational. They do not work in the way the computers do, signal in, processing signal out. Instead, this machine, this compute machine that we have in our heads acting very irrational, but sometimes predictable. You can guess what people, how people will react after you analyze their world, and we will get to the details of how to do it very soon. So basically, there are a lot of books that allow you to sway people in the right direction. You saw three, which are a great example. We have more down the road. And what you need to remember is what they really care about. Let us also not forget about people caring about things is the, what the decision makers care about sometimes, right? When it comes to influences, not just your peers in the organization, but folks who have the decision-making authority, 
their rationale may be creating that legacy. So that sets them up for an opportunity for another transformation like that or another successful journey of the company. And that's also an important uh, uh, psychological factor to consider as you try to influence folks. And when it comes to psychological factors, Baruch, I think, has quite a number for you to, to, look, to look at and consider to help you diagnose the other party. So here are some examples of what goes on in the head of the other person when you try to convince them to do something for you. They will ask, will it help me to get measured, to, to, to raise my measurements on the stuff that I measured? They will ask themselves if that's something which aligns with what their boss expects from them. They will ask themselves, will they actually enjoy doing it or it will be painful for them? They will ask themselves if they're aligned with their career goals. Are they in the, in the rapid uh, promotion path or maybe they are in a specialization path? They will ask themselves, how do I think my peers will react? Will it something that will make me more cool or less cool? They will ask themselves, do they have even the capacity to embark on this journey? They will ask themselves, is the will the organization support this effort, they will ask themselves, or this is not even the question, they will know if it comes natural from them or not based on their background. And of course, they, it, it, it has to uh, be, uh, it has to even be possible considering the things that are going on in their lives. All of those considerations bring us to the next two steps in the model, clarifying your priorities and diagnosing the world of others. Let's start with clarifying your own priority. Obviously, as we talked about it, the evolutionary pressure that all the organizations facing today uh, is a good, good place to start, right? Doing the right thing for yourself, for the company, for your peers is incredibly important. Not the least of which is also making sure that the environment in which you work, the tools that we use, the way you go about doing your job, is also built such that you enjoy uh, taking uh, part of that journey, right? So having the right tools, having the right techniques, avoiding unnecessary conflicts, right? And also, let's not forget, building up your own resume so you pick up some useful skills uh, to uh, set you up for your next journey. There are many, many other factors that you will uh, have for yourself. So we're not gonna dive into trying to diagnose every attendee on this webinar. You probably know your motivation better than others, but we will talk a bit about diagnosing the world of the other person and where can you do, uh, what can you do and where can you find the data, right? Some very concrete clues that will help you understand what drives the teams or the people that you're trying to partner up with. Of course, and when we're talking about diagnosing the world of other of other person, we need to know how to measure uh, uh, what uh, what is going on in their head in the context of what we try to achieve. And what we try to achieve is um, advancing in state of DevOps in your organization. And the metrics for state of DevOps in your organization is the same um, state of DevOps report that I already mentioned. It uh, um, names four key uh, metrics, uh, the lead time uh, to deployment, the um, uh, deployment frequency, the uh, change failure rate, and the time to restore service as the key metrics. And then um, in the report, and especially in the Accelerate book, there is very, very um, uh, concrete examples of how to measure it and how to apply it to your organization. With those metrics collected, you can start analyzing the world of other people to build a good um, a strategy of how to convince them that going from low to elite is in their back best interest. So uh, there's, uh, those are great measures. Those are very concrete measures. You can apply that to DevOps specific, but there are a lot of other measures in the organization that people are being motivated and driven by. So let's talk about some of the areas where you can look for your other clues. If your organization has some kind of OKR process, objective and key results, or some kind of objective goal setting process, you can go and look at the goals of the teams you're trying to work with or other teams that you're considering partnering up with to understand what are some of the key results and see if you can find some alignment 
with the transformation. You can also go and look at the backlog or a prioritized work of what they're working on, whether it's Jira or some kind of other backlog system, or perhaps a presentation that the team does on periodic basis, reporting on their status, right? Those are typically available through your SharePoints, your wikis, and places that can give you the clues as to what's important for a particular team, particular organization, maybe a particular individual. And again, let's not forget uh, the water cooler talk uh, that we already covered, the socializing with people in casual conversations to understand what may be driving the day-to-day -day transformations. And uh, in order to help you today, we're going to give you also some concrete examples of on archetypes in different archetypes you will encounter in these DevOps transformations to help you understand some of the more concrete drivers that may be driving them uh, for certain behaviors. And of course, today we're gonna to start with developers, right? And uh, like, like everybody else, like any knowledge worker, as the book Drive that we mentioned specifies, uh, we all strive for autonomy. And in case of your development archetype, the autonomy uh, for the developer is getting the code into the production environment as quickly as possible with minimal set of obstacles, which may materialize as, you know, I don't want to deal with in the system an ops person or an SRE every time I need to get a bug fix or a new feature into a production environment. When it comes following the model of uh, the drive book of autonomy, mastery, and purpose, uh, when we look at the mastery of developers and how we can align their mastery uh, with DevOps, is actually DevOps requires a certain type of applications. Um, we can talk about uh, 12 factor apps uh, or beyond 12 after 18, 18 factor, but in the end of the day, it is about how the apps are written in order to provide massive scalability elasticity, um, support for cloud native, obviously running in Kubernetes, working with uh, Istio, et cetera, et cetera. And all this is about mastery of developers. Can they craft the software that is required to be truly scalable cloud native? Continuing on the drive principles, let's talk a bit about a purpose. For the developer archetype, it's pretty simple. It's great software that everybody loves in the production environment. It matters only when that software got into the production environment, being used by the user or the customer, and the developer gets feedback on it. And uh, once we understood those three, those are the three from the, uh, from the drive uh, book, there is one more aspect that you always need to keep in mind when you go and influence people, what they fear of. And again, their fear is by their archetype, if you wish, and the question is, what is the fear of developers when it comes to DevOps transformation? For developers, the fear is we will have much more work. All this DevOps plot is just sysadmins trying to offload their work on, on the developers. And now the developers should not only write code, but also deploy it and maintain it in production. And that's a lot of load. Why would we do that? So this is their fear that you need to first understand and then be able to answer. The next archetype in the software development lifecycle is the testing team, right? Their job is to make sure that what we deliver is of the right quality, continues to work as expected, meets all the non-functional requirements. And for that reason, their autonomy needs have to do with ability to do all of this without having uh, any unnecessary dependencies on other teams, which, may, which can mean having as many test environments, being able to deploy into those test environments at will, being able to destroy those test environments and conduct destructive testing when they need and being able to recreate them, ideally with a click of a button. That's the kind of autonomy a high quality testing team tends to strive for. For mastery, Obviously, the mastery of the, of the testers of the QA team is being able to provide quality. And uh, usually in uh, a lot of organizations, this ability is tampered by viewing the QA team as the bottleneck. Oh, they stand behind us and, uh, um, and, and the production. Let's cut the time allocated for QA and those, those kind of, of, of things. Uh, so DevOps that uh, actually promises baking the quality into the pipeline answers this mastery uh, aspect of the of the QA team. 
Of course, for the QA team, the purpose is pretty simple, right? Production quality software that doesn't break every time we deploy, that does what it's supposed to do, does it within the parameters that were specified, both the functional and non-functional. They strive to make sure that the developers deliver, and they, not just the developers in the good environment, the entire team delivers an overall quality to the customer, because ultimately, if you remember, what do they want? They want those features, that what matters. And the, the biggest fear of the, of the QA uh, people, of the testers, is that they will be automated out of the job by DevOps. Um, I have another talk that I uh, delivered in a couple of um, uh, QA in, in the uh, testers conferences. Um, we have DevOps, let's fire all the testers. Um, obviously, that's a, uh, uh, that, that's a fake title. This is not going to happen, and it's your job to convince those who worry about it, that it's not going to happen. So continuing our journey uh, through the archetypes, the next logical one is the operations team, right? The site reliability engineers, as they now like to be called. And uh, they all have their own needs. Their needs for autonomy is being able to deploy the software, upgrade the software, maybe scale the software, move the software from one point to another with minimal dependencies on another team, whether it's the development team because the configuration is automated and documented or the test team because perhaps they have an automated regression suite that they can apply to a new production environment after deploying it without having to get in line to wait for somebody from the testing team to come and certify that environment for them. Uh, mastery is easy. Obviously, the mastery of uh, service or site reliability engineers is what DevOps tooling is all about. Um, all the CNCF uh, foundation portfolio, um, every single uh, project there is the mastery of the new ops people of the SREs. The purpose of the operations person is also pretty simple. Much like testers, they strive for one thing up and running, available durable production environment with the software available to the customers with, in that case, very concrete measures, SLAs, SLOs, uh, performance uh, uh, metrics, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the things that tend to drive those folks uh, along the side of overarching theme of system stability. And their biggest fear is giving up control, but still being blamed for things that go wrong. So once they build those pipelines and developers start to deploy their code directly in production, when things go wrong, they will be the ones to blame. And obviously they are not very happy with this equation because they don't, uh, uh, this fear needs to be answer, answered as well. Interestingly enough, on our journey to the production environment, like a lot of the organizations, we forgot about security before operations. And let's talk about that archetype. Security in this day is incredibly important. Uh, I'm sure you all read the news and you understand the reputational risk from a breach to a company. For some companies, that may mean kiss of death. Uh, and therefore, security is becoming a much more important part of the software development life cycle, especially given the velocity at which we're all now moving and they have their needs as well. When it comes to the autonomy, it's, all, it's being able to make as much impact as they can, again, without those third-party dependencies. And those dependencies can manifest in requiring vulnerability, patching and upgrades for operating systems, remediation of uh, vulnerability that were reported or found by a penetration test, ability to have environments much like the testers where they can conduct destructive security testing in a like production environment to ensure they provide the best possible safety net to your organization. And that changes the mastery of the security people. Now, now, not only they need to be the masters of the penetration tools and the masters of uh, uh, presentations in the meetings about how bad the security is, they have an entire new set of tools that they need to master all the DevSecOps uh, portfolio uh, tools that, uh, for example, scan the images and the containers like Jeffrog X-Ray and, and, and others. So their mastery is now DevSecOps tools. Now, when it comes to their purpose, I'll tell you from my experience, good security folks hate to be the bottleneck. They don't want to be the bad cop. They don't want to be the bad guy in the pipeline. They want to enable the organization to deliver software as fast as it needs to be delivered while still maintaining the security, uh, privacy, and all other aspects that they tend to worry about. So for them, the purpose is really 
support the organization in its velocity and support it such that the pipeline continues to be secure and deliver secure software. And of course, their fear is ending up in the news and being blamed for security issues. If DevOps helps with that fear, then DevOps is a good thing for those people. The next archetype will depend on the type of company you are. Uh, if you're a product company, a software company that builds software products, you probably have software uh, product managers. If you are a, a company that uses software for internal operations, you may have a business analyst or somebody generally representing the business and we'll call that archetype product here. Obviously, they, they also have the same strives and the strive for autonomy, i.e. ability to deliver features and deliver the features that they believe uh, that the organization requires to be successful without any unnecessary obstacles. Their mastery is being able to experiment as much as possible. Since no one knows what the customer would really like, either internal or external, not even the customers themselves, the only way to deliver the right set of features is putting something in the hand of customers and see how they use it and if they like it or not. DevOps allows us to build um, um, a lot of different pipelines that provide a lot of different experiments and fail cheap. This is how DevOps actually helps mastery of product, user, business um, um, uh, people. And quite often the way to enable that autonomy and mastery is through metrics, right? And you can think of the ultimate metrics, i.e. the profit, but it's a pretty coarsely grain metrics. So enable to, uh, to, in order to enable that purpose, uh, they need uh, other metrics, usage, understanding how people use the software, what does the software do, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately in most organizations, the purpose is either profit, kind of high aspirational success, right? Maybe industry recognition for being a leader in your own space or perhaps uh, success uh, that is measured in the ways related to the specific industries. And the biggest fear is delivering the wrong thing, investing a lot in delivering features that no one really wants. Um, DevOps obviously answers this fear. When uh, we iterate fast and we release often, we can minimize the risk of doing the wrong thing. And this is how uh, DevOps helps this uh, product people fear. So it looks like you need to know everything about everybody, which is you need to be the developer, the ops, the QA, the security and the product in your head in order to diagnose their world. And this is obviously impossible. But frankly, you don't really need to. Instead, you need to be you and you need to understand a little bit about each and every one of them. So those five slides that we went through, it's obviously not enough, but also it doesn't mean now that you need to go and specialize in each and every of those aspects. Instead, you need to become what is called the T-shaped people. When we actually, um, uh, w what we actually mean is that you have a deep specialization, you are who you are, and I would assume for CNCF webinar, we have a lot of people that come from OBS background, a lot of people who come from dev background, be you, but also invest in understanding other people's world. It will help you in your job, especially if you're already doing DevOps correctly, and it will also help you convincing for DevOps. One last thing that I really would suggest is, although you might like duck typing in your development, Python, Groovy, whatever um, dynamic language you use, avoid stereotyping when it comes to people. People might surprise you, not everyone fills into this pigeonhole that we just drawn, so be open-minded. So hopefully this gives you a good context about the world diagnosis and understanding what you need to learn about your possible future partnering crimes in order to partner with them successfully. Now let's talk about how do you find that common motivation and how do you align on common goals and the model talks about identifying relevant currency, yours and theirs. What can you offer and what can they offer for that uh, journey? And there are several types of currencies that we can talk about. There are- One of them is money, by the way. Um, all of them are currencies uh, which are 
currency in your organizational negotiation, if you like. Um, they can easily be um, inspiration related, stuff like you just excite the other person so much, they really want to do it. Uh, it can be task related, uh, what you suggest will help them do what they already supposed to do better. Uh, position related, what you suggest them will advance their career. Relationship related, they will do something just a favor for you because you build this relationship. Or even person related, if you know the other person well enough, you know which buttons to push to actually make them do the right thing. And making the right things means creating uh, sym symbiotic relationships, right? Where both parties get some kind of benefit, even in places where, you know, the parties may not be of equal size, equal value, or equal placement in the organization. And there are several good examples of how to get those relationships created. And I think Baro has an excellent one for you. So here is an example, which is a, a, a great currency. And that's a hackathon. It's actually two currencies in one. It's this like multifaceted tool. From one side, you can actually provide value to the other person. Whoever you need to sway your way can benefit from the labors of the hackathon that you organized. They will obviously owe you a favor and will do the right thing. But, so that's kind of a task related currency. But the hackathon is also inspiration related uh, currency because hackathon is implementing DevOps in, the, uh, in a micro level. You uh, build empower teams and you deliver value very, very fast. And you can use those teams and, and the outcomes of the hackathon as a great example of how DevOps can help release faster and inspire people by pointing them that way. So that's an inspiration related currency. I'm sure if you counted the number of times we said the word people and understanding people, uh, you would realize that the important part of all of this is dealing with human relationships. It's not about technology. It's not about the process. It's not about the tools. It's about those variable feedback time, non-deterministic machines known as human. And uh, the model also agrees with that. And there was an entire section in the model uh, requiring you to be successful to understand how to deal with those relationships. Yeah, basically the idea is you don't want to end up like this. Um, we already mentioned some books that help you understand people better. There are much more. And here are more examples of the books that we definitely suggest you to read in order to understand people better and be able to convince them better actually by, as I mentioned, pushing the right button sometimes. So you will have to do that mastery as homework. There's not enough time on a webinar of any kind to teach you all of those skills. And I'm sure you have some of those already from your personal lives. So why don't we move on to the last step of the model, which is the influence through give and take. Uh, also known uh, in, in the world as quid pro quo. And, um, you know, quid pro quo lately has, uh, and uh, in the world quite often, has a lot of negative connotations, right? About exchanging something for a nefarious purpose. This is not the kind of quid pro quo we are talking about. Most real organizations today function because there's some kind of quid pro quo happening. And several examples could be, you know, you have access to a particular server that somebody else needs and you gave them because you can spare it. Or you've received some favor from a team that you've been working on with and they kind of pitched in and help you, for example, to finish a manual regression test if that's still an issue on time. That's a great example. Let's try to um, put some labels on those examples and others. So we'll give you some concrete types of the exchanges that can happen in the organization uh, with some examples. So number one is interest alignment. You, you and your other parties that you're trying to uh, work with uh, are going towards the common goal, whether it's launching a feature delivering a project, maybe stabilizing the system. That's one type of exchange where uh, that interest alignment can drive. Another example is exactly what just uh, Leonie just mentioned, um, uh, just barter. I have staging servers that I don't need. Do you want to use them for your penetration testing? And if you, if you want to use, then you will owe me a favor that I can call later. And favors and kind of owing and, 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 and calling in a favor is a very common way for human relationships, right? We 
Um, and I think thinking about that and being proactive about that, i.e. not starting from a position where you ask for a favor, but possibly doing a favor is a very useful technique to start getting the relationship with the teams you've identified uh, going and starting to build that relationship so you can partner up with them. And with that, this is the end of the model. And I think it's the end of the webinar. Well, not really. I think uh, we would be uh, at fault if we didn't leave you with some more concrete examples of how to deal with the most important thing you will be running in those influence uh, uh, setups without authority is getting to yes and uh, you know uh, getting through no. So let's talk about some concrete examples. So uh, there, there are, are several barriers that you have to overcome and those barriers can be both external and internal, right? So for example, an example of an external barrier is uh, the power differential we saw at the very beginning of Alex's journey where Alex was stuck at the very bottom of the org chart and the influencer and the decision makers he needed to influence uh, were at the very top. There may be different goals. We talked about discovering OKRs, discovering priorities of the teams you're trying to partner with. They may have mutually incompatible goals. So that's an external barrier you may need to overcome. The measures may not be compatible. You know, if, if your ops team is measured just purely on SLA uh, that precludes feature delivery, that's an example of incompatible measure for the overall organizational success. And, you know, there's good old team rivalry. Microsoft was famous for pitting teams against each other. And you have to be aware of those uh, and figure out how to overcome them. Some barriers are internal and the hardest barriers, internal barriers, are the barriers in you. For example, lack of experience with the model. You heard about this model before you rush and implement it uh, in uh, trying to influence in the, for DevOps in your entire organization, do a smaller experiment. Try to influence for smaller things just to get experience with the model. Another one is blinding attitude. You can give up on some things without trying them just because you think you will never succeed oh, I'm not going to try and influence this big boss because there is no chance. If you want to try, how, how you will ever succeed. Another important internal barrier is fear of failing. I won't even start on this journey of transformation because I will probably fail in this way or another, so why bother? And um, another one uh, is fear of reaction. Um, if you think that uh, you will be punished for your uh, initiatives, then you will restrain yourself from even trying. For this one, uh, last one, the fear of reaction, my suggestion would be always having best alternative to negotiated agreement, or known as a uh, BETNA. A BETNA is what do you do when there is no agreement? When you try to convince someone and you got no. The worst thing you can do is just not having one. Well, I have no idea what I will do because then you will restrain yourself from being the best you in negotiation. Another bad one is I'll pretend that nothing happened. And I'll pretend, I'll pretend that nothing happened means that you need to be able to undo what just happened. And that means that you cannot do bold moves because bold moves are impossible to undo. You might realize that Whatever you do now, there is no coming back and you will have a look for a new job after you burn your bridges and fail in, the, uh, in your efforts. Uh, looking for a new job is stressful, it's hard, especially now, so you might want to give up on the entire attempt. The best bet you can have when you go into this kind of influence for um, DevOps transformation is actually having a great plan B in this is a job offer in your pocket, then you will be your best in trying to influence uh, for, for, for DevOps. Um, another important aspect is look at the end goal. Consider the, the entire uh, journey and you might want to uh, lose a battle to win a war and give up something to actually reach the end goal in the end of the day. And while you do that, it's also important uh, to remember that with some partners and some uh, parties, you're going to have one silver bullet to shoot. So you have to come prepared. You have to come uh, educated about their world uh, so you don't waste that shot. Uh, 
With that, I think it's important for us to get into uh, some concrete examples. And let's use a simple one that we already touched on in the presentation. Uh, an engineer saying, hey, you know what, this whole DevOps thing means I'm gonna be on call and it's not my job, I'm, I just code. So there are great answers to this, uh, to this objection. Um, I try to summarize them in my talk, DevOps for Developers, or maybe against them when I actually battle this exact objection uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, and give you some ideas of how to do it. The link to this talk is in the show notes. And just to remind you, the link to the show notes is in the bottom of each and every slide. So a next common objection is like, hey, listen, we've gotten to where we've gotten. We're very successful. Like, why, why should we change? What, what's wrong with what we're doing right now? Um, the world changed. The world changed a lot, uh, uh, both in terms of the evolutionary pressure for features that we already mentioned, but also security can be um, um, a very big driver for, for change. So if your boss... Um, don't want to end up in the papers as um, someone who got fired because of security vulnerability, you cannot keep doing what you were doing previously. All right, all right, all right. You convinced me, but you know what? There's no time. We are so busy. The roadmap is so long. We don't have enough people. We're just overloaded here. Well, everybody are overloaded. There is no time for anything for anybody, but it doesn't mean that we don't need to strive to be better. We actually have to force ourselves to get our head out of the water and look for ways to be more efficient. So you spend some money, you spend some time in order to get time down the road when you actually implement DevOps correctly. Listen, uh, you also keep talking about this T-shaped personality, understanding the world of others, but like, don't you end up with people that know a bit about everything, but nothing about a lot? And like, aren't silos good for specialization and you need specialization? You definitely need specialization. Specialization is great, but specialization in the silos won't help you to solve the problem of your pipeline. If you have a bottleneck in your pipeline, as a great Elia Goldrat teaches us in another great book that called The Goal, that the Phoenix project actually based on, then you are actually not solving any problems. You might have great, uh, amazing specialists in uh, uh, for for this example um, in uh, in the stations two and three. But if your bottleneck is number four, the specialists in two and three won't help you not a little bit to actually release faster. Yeah, but I I can't uh, like blend everything together. We have regulations like and you know name your own favorite regulation: HIPAA, PCI, DSS, uh, Financial Authority of Singapore, uh, whatever. Right? Th those regulations prescribe that we have uh, separation of duties. We need to make sure that you know things that we change in productions are controlled. Like you, you're talking about this whole blending of teams together. How can we make that work in that environment? That's a great question. And it's actually a question that have, we have been asked uh, in the Q&A panel as well. You can add still more questions, by the way. Um, and the answer will be stop uh, trying to um, uh, approve or to pass the regulations uh, by looking at the end product. Instead, switch to certifying the pipeline. Once you certify the pipeline, every product by definition will be certified and all the regulatory bodies actually acknowledge that and will allow you to certify the pipeline instead of certifying each and every version of each and every project. All right, all right, that's great, but you, you still confuse me. We have to release faster, but then you said we have to worry about security because the world has changed. But like, it takes time to certify something for the security or it takes time for those features to make sure that they're high quality by our testing teams. We, we can just simply start releasing faster. And that's the ultimate objection for adapting DevOps. We cannot move too fast because we need to pay attention to details. And you know who's good in paying attention to details? Machines are. Machines are much better in doing monotonous work of 
creating of, of building something out of humans creation and then passing it through security gate through quality gates over a release pipelines. So all we need to do is letting machines do that. Once we have that, we can benefit from both worlds, from releasing faster and being with the quality and the security that it requires. So a mythical uh, hero, Alex, being fully equipped with all of those techniques and objection handling ideas, partners up with several teams in the organization and successfully transforms it to DevOps to the point where uh, Alex becomes the CIO of the org. And not only that, he gets headhunted given the success that Alex had by another org and does that same journey again and again. So to summarize. To summarize, two things. First of all, the model, give it a look, give it a thought, practice it. And we believe that following this model, you can be influential without being the boss. And uh, remember to diagnose the part of, uh, and the motivation of others, right? Understanding the other party is incredibly important for that successful transformation through influence. With that, thank you very much for a last time I'm Jay Baruch on Twitter. I am at Elegonic on Twitter. And just the show notes are at jfrog.com, the show notes. And but since we are in the shameless plug section, I want to remind you that we have our own uh, Jfrog user conference coming up uh, in the end of June. Uh, go to swampup.jfrog.com to learn about the agenda, the amazing speakers and the amazing content. With that, thank you very much. We have two minutes. So if you have more questions, shoot them now. Well, I guess no questions. So you know where to find us offline, on Twitter, obviously. And uh, um, with that, thank you very much for coming and uh, have a great uh, rest of your day. Enjoy your weekend. Oh, it's Friday. It is Friday. That's great news.